Hey everyone, welcome to session 71 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Today I have a fun conversation with the folks from ABA Inside Track, and we are co, I guess, publishing it on their platform as well. This is a 2018 year in review show, and it was the brainchild of Dr. Jackie McDonald. And she messaged me a few months ago and said, hey, we're thinking of doing this kind of uh, year in review slash retrospective episode on uh, the year that was. Would you like to come do it with us? And I said, heck yeah. I, I've uh, met Jackie and Diana uh, at uh, conferences over the years. I've had some correspondence with Rob as well. Uh, they're really great folks. And uh, yeah, it's fun to uh, talk podcasting with my podcasting peers. And I'm glad we were able to pull this off. So uh, what do we talk about in this show? We talk about a couple, we talk about had like four major themes. We talked about passings of notable behavior analysts in 2018. Then we talk about some important events that happened uh, and spend quite a bit of time talking about the Time's Up ABA slash Me Too uh, events of uh, 2018 and the impact that's had on the field. We talk about the growth of the field, uh, not just the benefits of it, but some potential challenges that that um, has uh, and we finish with talking about what we're looking forward to in the year of 2019. Uh, so one of the things that came to mind after we wrapped up the recording is that I forgot some things that I was looking forward to. That I, I mentioned some things I was looking forward to, but forgot a couple things. So I want to mention them here real quick. Uh, one is is that uh, Dr. Lisa Britton and I will have a book coming out on remote fieldwork supervision for BCBA trainees. That should be out sometime this spring, uh, definitely before ABAI, uh, but right now we're not exactly sure when it will be published. We're still submitting final proofs and things like that, but uh, this was a, a project that we've worked on for, gosh, like a year and a half or so, and it's been, it's been a fun learning experience for me because I've uh, quite honestly never written a book before. And uh, so this will be, uh, I guess, an experience that we'll see how it works out. But it was definitely fun. And I think we have some good information to share with readers. So uh, we'll be talking more about that in podcast episodes down the line. So you can stay tuned if that's something that you are interested in. Uh, one of the all things I also forgot to mention, both retrospectively and going forward as well, is the Do Better movement, which has been spearheaded by Dr. Megan Miller. And I can't remember the specific podcast episode off the top of my head, but uh, about this time last year, she came on the podcast and talked about the Do Better movement that she uh, created, essentially. General idea is that uh, we can all do better, and that's not like a like a, a guilt type of thing. It's like it's a call to continue to hone your skills as a behavior analyst. And she had uh, twelve themes over the twelve months of twenty eighteen, and uh, she's continuing that. Uh, one of the places you can learn more about this is the Do Better Professional Development Facebook group, of which I will have links to in the show notes. So go join that group and uh, see what's going to happen with Do Better in 2019. So, Megan, sorry, I forgot to mention that in the episode proper, but i um, trying to make up for it here. Please don't yell at me. Just kidding. Uh, and, um, yeah, and at the end of this episode, we even uh, they even make me sing a little bit. So if you have company for the holidays and you want to get rid of them, just fast forward to the end and play. You know, hear us uh, singing uh, Old Lang Syne. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, I, you know, I'm, uh, kind of proud about with this episode is that we avoided talking about uh, major pop culture, you know, kind of uh, sidebars until the very end. I think we went like a, an hour and 15 minutes before uh, getting off track. Um, and again, we end uh, uh, with some some unfortunate singing. So you have that to look forward to. <laughs> Please, I, I hope that doesn't uh, affect any potential iTunes reviews in the negative direction. So, uh, two things real quick before we get to the episode itself is that one is uh, I have a great special going on for CEs. So, if you go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEs, uh, I've got uh, 12 CEs for about $7.70 a piece, I think is what it works out to with the discount. So, if you buy all 12 CEs in the store and use the offer code bundle, uh, you can save quite a bit. 
uh, over 50% of what it would cost uh, normally. Uh, And then secondly, uh, this podcast is sponsored by the Himalaya Podcast Player app. So if you are frustrated with the native podcast player apps that are on your Apple or Android device, go to your app store and download Himalaya and be sure to follow the Behavioral Observations podcast. So uh, I think that's it for opening remarks, and there are no other commercial interruptions during this conversation. So without any further ado, please enjoy this fun look back at 2018 with my pals from ABA Inside Track. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey, everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, or one of one of four hosts that we have tonight, Robert Perry Cruz. And I'm joined, uh, I'm joined with two people that I'm usually joined with, and, and in a podcast mash up uh just just in time for the holidays we have a fourth special co-host so why don't we go around let's go around the horn uh and start with i'll start with my lovely wife hey rob it's diana and it's jackie and then not our, wife not wife and then our super special co-host from the behavioral observations podcast hey guys it's matt sicori i'm also not robert's wife just in case <laughs> anyone was confused this is well, awesome thanks guys too. for uh, inviting me to do this i've been psyched ever since jackie reached out and uh, uh, pitch the idea. So thanks so much for uh, letting me butt in on the show. Not a, pr- not, a, not a problem at all, man. We're glad to have you here. So, so excited. So for those of you new to ABA Inside Track or possibly to Behavioral Observations, and I don't know how this is the episode you decided to listen to, <laughs> but uh, we are both podcasts about behavior analysis. And since we're coming up on the end of 2018, we decided let's do a little little year in review of, of behavior analysis and sort of some prognosticating about what What's going to happen in 2019? Uh, And so Jackie and Diana uh, had thought, well, we should probably just get all the behavior analysis podcasts we can find together to do that. And and that sounded like fun to me, just like it was to Matt. And so here we all are. Hooray. You know the prediction game now, Rob? The prediction game? Yeah, yeah. What's You're prognosticating? Prognosticate. Oh, yeah. That's yeah? my new. Yeah, I, I take it around the country. I do phrenology and <laughs> prognostication. Okay. Yeah. Well, behavior analysis is about the prediction behavior, but maybe not quite in that way. <laughs> that's, I usually think of that more as a probability than a... <laughs> Oh, so why don't we get started? So Matt, you were you were so kind to send us a nice a nice document that we're going to follow with to to put some ideas together. So it's not too rambly uh, for this special episode. So uh, we're going to start off by doing kind of like at the Oscars. We're going to do our, our our unfortunate news first, the passings of some of the leaders in the behavior analytic field. And and the first one we have here is is Tony Nevin. And Matt, you have a you 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 knew you knew Tony and you have a you wrote it as a story time so why don't you share a little <laughs> bit about your memories of of Tony sure sure I uh, took Tony's last the last class I went to the University of New Hampshire where Tony was a professor and professor emeritus and all that stuff um, and I happened upon his class it wasn't the first behavior analysis class I took but it was the uh, the one right after the first which I guess would make it the second one uh, and. <laughs> Uh, and, and, the, and the course was called Behavior Modification, which perhaps ages me, I suppose. And, right. you know, <laughs> um, but that, that's what it was called. And, uh, and, and even though Tony is, you know, well known for his work in the experimental analysis of behavior, you know, it was a, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, basically, you know, early ABA stuff. And again, this was circa 95-ish, I think, 1994, 1995. Yeah. And uh, it was the very last class he taught at UNH. In fact, it was the um, – I remember he handed out the professor evaluations that, you know, you have to do at the end of every college class. And he, you know, as professors sometimes do, they leave the room, you know, so as not to uh, stare at people and, you know, make sure they give them good marks and things like that. And someone said, hey, what do we do with this? Because he just kind of left this manila envelope. And he's like – 
I don't care. This is my last <laughs> class I'm ever teaching. You could do whatever you want with it. You know, it was, it was like obviously acknowledging there were zero consequences for, you know, I mean, we could put all ones or zeros or whatever right. the Likert scale was. And, you know, it didn't matter a whit. So anyway, um, yeah, so that was around the time that uh, behavior analysis was kind of getting its hooks into me. And yeah, even though he retired from the department, he maintained a laboratory because he had a um, he still had grants going and things like that. And his last graduate student, Randy Grace, who's uh, an esteemed researcher in the EAB world uh, on his own, uh, ran Some the lab. Some people may have heard of him. I'm sorry? <laughs> Some people may have heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, uh, uh, he maintained and ran the lab for the next year or two. And uh, so I, uh, Tony and Randy gave me my first job as a, my first work, college work study job working in the pigeon lab. And, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, it was cool. And like the first day, I remember I was like, uh, we, he said, can you get here on Saturday? I'm like, sure. You know, and so I get there like Saturday morning. And so uh, he had come up from um, uh, his home uh, on the Cape where he retired to and he was going to work with Randy all day. And so Randy and Tony sat me down just myself and started explaining all their research to me. Again, wow. a 20, 21 year old kid you know, who just took his second behavior analysis class. And they're talking about oh the God. matching law. They're talking about like, you know, uh, multiple schedules and concurrent chains and all sorts of things like that. And it was like, they were trying to like get me up to speed on what they were doing. And at one point, Tony just looked at me and he's like, I think we've lost you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, yes, you have, you know. Um, you know, and I think one of the things I was... Uh, always liked about Tony and, and not that I knew him super well. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to, you know, we weren't, you know, super, you know, buds or anything like that, but the, we can talk about his contributions to the field and stuff like that. But the, I think the thing that made its impression on me was that he treated me, this, this undergrad who didn't know anything um, like an esteemed colleague, you know, uh, rather That's than so nice. the 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 the, the per, you know the person at the at the point in time in my career that I was, so I think that that uh, that I think was just a really you know kind of that, that always stuck with me, and I think it was it was a good lesson for me to learn. Uh, I, I had bumped into him at various uh, ABAIs over the years. Um, I always recognized me, and he was like, "Hey, Matt," and he was like, "Oh my gosh," you know, and stuff like, and it was just really, it's like. Yeah, he had no reason to remember me, you know, and and, mm -hmm. and I it, it, and again that just uh, made an impression on me. What what a, what a neat guy he was. The time he he took to uh, and the interest he took uh, in 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 uh, you know trying to like I said that little you know one on one lesson trying to get me up to speed with what they were doing and and just the opportunity. You know, it was pretty cool to get a reference letter to my grad school uh, applications with uh, you know with, with his name on it. Um, yeah, just no a really kidding. neat guy. Uh, so will be sorely missed. I am. I think uh, Jackie and I were messaging shortly after the news of his passing uh, we, you know, was circulated, and I, I'm. Uh, I was always one of those things. I was going to try to catch up with him at an ABBA to mm -hmm. do an interview with him, and I just never got the chance. And I was, you know, so that that's something that uh, I really wish I got an opportunity to do. I think it would have been cool, but you know, he obviously has a uh, a legacy of. Uh, of his works in the you know behavioral momentum and uh, other areas in terms of his uh, interest in behavior analysis and social issues and things like that. Just a really neat guy, very uh, uh, influential, m more so on a personal level for me. You know, so yeah, he'll sorely be missed. My, me too. So my my story with Tony Nevin was I actually conducted my master's thesis on behavior momentum. As um, did I. As did Diana. So we we had lots of meetings with Tony Nevin, um, but my I did not know him prior to doing my first presentation at ABAI on behavior momentum. So I was in this like I was in the EAB portion of ABAI squab and I was in this huge like dark room and I was so scared and I was like sweating all over the place because I was you know just a little I hadn't even graduated yet <laughs> um and Tony was in the front row and I hadn't looked up his picture and he's in the front row and I'm talking and he's like smiling and like vigorously shaking his head yes and like I like showed a graph and he was like thumbs upping me in the audience. And I was like, who is this guy? Like, I like 
this is amazing. Like, why is this dude? Like, I don't know him. And he's like all up in my grill, like so happy. And then like when I finished, like he came up and talked to me, like gave me a huge hug. And I'm a super hugger, by the way. Um, and he didn't introduce himself, but started asking me questions. Yeah. And he he asked me a question I didn't know, obviously. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I really think you should contact Tony Nevin to answer this question for you. Because he, you know, he <laughs> kind of made this whole thing up. And he's like, I am Tony Nevin. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was our, so every time he saw me, he's like, remember me, Tony Nevin. Oh, was, my gosh. That's awesome. But, it was great. So that's a just that's sweet, a good memory. Sweet that's man. a good. He has a good memory too. You yeah. Know, like re- just remembering that interaction. That's yeah. great. Yeah. We should all be so lucky in, in, uh, as we get older, right? Oh, yeah. Geez, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what do I want to add? You guys did a nice job, I think, of covering everything. I was just thinking, Matt, when you were saying that they, Tony and Randy, sat you down and like explained everything about their research to you that that was right before the publication of Nevin and Grace 2000, I'm thinking, right? Like time-wise? Oh, it was was about five years before that. Yeah, but you know how long those things take. Of course, yeah. And I just looked up the title of it. Oh, Behavioral Momentum and the Law of Effect. And it's a 60-page document that like lays out this the entire theory of behavioral momentum. And I remember when I was... What's a little light reading, you know? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, right? So, and I remember when I was doing this as for my master's thesis, this was like the ultimate article to try to get through and understand. I what never did. Behavioral momentum actually <laughs> is. Yeah, it's a it's a big one. It's really Heavy. it's a multiple parter. You mm-hmm. really want to sit down multiple times with this one, but this is probably what they were formulating. As they were talking to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was, right, it was, you, should, you should be a footnote. Full yeah. credit. And their acknowledgments down here, right? I suspect. I think one of the papers, there is a footnote, you know, nice. basically saying that, you know, yeah, uh, me and a couple of other folks in the lab were the people who put the pigeons in the chamber and hit enter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's pretty much what we did. You know, we moved pigeons from point A to point B, put them in their experimental chambers and, you know hit enter, you know, to, on the, and the computer took care of the rest of it. And then we, you know, just kind of like, stu- we would just study and we'd do our homework, things like that. Yeah. And, and you totally... let no compounds in. That's a very important job. Yes. No <laughs> compounds That's were right. allowed. I was quiet. <laughs> believe me. Right. You're the keeper of the compounds. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. We used to put little yeah. granite pebbles in their cages and stuff like that. It was, it was a good time, <laughs> you know. That's awesome. You gave them extra pellets. You're like, you look so hungry. <laughs> I did not do that, but <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. I know. This one was like a little thin. Yeah. No, no, no. 85 percent of free feeding weight. <laughs> That's funny. Done, Very good. All right. So we, all right. So we had some. We had some. Unfortunately, some other passings in the field. And Jack, you you have a you have an interesting anecdote I think to share. Yeah. So uh, the second notable behavior analyst that has passed in our field was Tristan Smith. Um, And I was first introduced to uh, applied behavior analysis through a presentation that Tristan Smith did at a floor time therapy conference. How did you end up at a floor time therapy conference? So when I was in college, undergraduate at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I started working as a floor time therapist first. Don't tell anyone. (gasps) Um, no just know. between us, right? No one just between us. Just friends. Um, <laughs> and I went to a conference. My company sent me to this comp- uh, conference. And Tristan uh, got up and they invited him, which is also crazy. Maybe just to be mean. Ma- well, they were very like, mean. Like Harry, they were like dump pig's blood on his head. Yeah, as so they were very mean. Something. So I didn't know who he was. I was actually sitting in the front row just because I was like. <laughs> thumbs up, smiles. No, I wasn't thumbs up, smiling, <laughs> but I was sitting in the front row. And so he had started talking about behavior analysis. I had no idea what it was. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, but the conference people, like the floor time people, were like booing him. Oh, and what? kissing him. One of them threw one of their conference books like at the what? podium. Yeah. So I was like oh, so shocked. Yeah, I was so shocked um, that they were so rude to him that when he was done, oh he was like, thank you for inviting me to this conference. <laughs> I was like, how does someone say thank you after like 
being booed basically and so he like left and i went into the hallway and i was like i'm so sorry that everybody was so rude to you i don't know who you are and you don't know who i am because i'm no one but mm. i you know like it sounded like great stuff that you were talking about <laughs> and he's like what yeah. is this behavior analysis he's like you really should look into aba it sounds like you'd love it and i was like cool and then i did and uh, now Jackie, I'm here. can you imagine if that would, we could probably substitute uh, Tristan Smith with other luminaries in the field, and oh, they would yeah. they would not have that reaction. You know, I can just imagine no, what right. like, you know, I, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna throw names out, but I can imagine other people would have been like, uh, yeah, and uh, I'm out of here, you know, or something. Right? Like that, you know? Yeah, but <laughs> or it was throw the book back, or you know, right? I don't know. Yeah. sort of like Axl Rose uh, rock right. star behavior, right. kind of like he, he <laughs> throw him over and throw your papers <laughs> up in the air. <laughs> hell with this place oh gee yeah he finished though i mean like he did his whole presentation i honestly don't remember i remember there was a single subject graph mm -hmm. on on the slide but i was like what's that because i have you know never never been exposed to that so but it was really i was i think i was so shocked that he was like so professional even in the midst of adversity mm. oh, yeah last act um, sounds like yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that the behavior analytic community was really shocked by Tris Smith's, Smith's death. Mm -hmm. It was very sudden. He was only 57 years old, and he was still in the middle of doing a lot of really great work. I never got to meet him personally, but mm -hmm. I came to know his work through my dissertation work, which was in early intensive behavioral intervention. So he's a really big name in that area. And like I said, he had some interesting ongoing research that hopefully some others will be able to continue. Um, and I you know, read a lot of his work in the context of reading all of the work <laughs> in the field <laughs> related to EIBI. But the study that I think I learned the most from him and, and is, is often cited is Smith Grain and Win, which is from 2000 in AJMR, and it's one of the only, only randomized controlled trials in the field of behavior analysis. Uh, so they did a comparison between a group of children with autism or related disabilities who were receiving a high number of hours of EIBI treatment as compared to a group that were receiving more limited um treatment, but it was mostly coming in the form of parent training. So they saw some differences between the groups, but not not huge differences between the groups. And I think that there's a lot to be said about that related to EIBI, but a lot to be said as well about Tris Smith and that he was able to get an RCT up and running and off the ground, right? So he was a really big proponent of early intensive behavioral intervention and really looking to find ways that that could be shared. So of course, within our field, we value single subject design and we see the value in, in the individual behavior change, but to the larger scientific community, those RCTs are really what they're looking for. So he had that type of uh, vision in designing this study. And um, it was definitely, uh, he's, his loss is definitely gonna be felt far and wide, I think, in that we lost someone who was gonna continue to contribute to this area in the future. Mm -hmm. It's a sad loss. Yeah. And Diana, you also added to the list, or, or, or added to the list, but we have here is, is a Dr. Kurt Salzinger, who passed away as well this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we definitely wanted to talk about him because he was a big name in the early years of behavior analysis. So he was an older gentleman who uh, most had worked at several different universities. Most recently, he was a professor emeritus at Hofstra, University. And when you go back and look at his research, he was in the middle of the beginning <laughs> of everything, right? So he uh, had a real varied um, background as far as his contrib contributions to behavior analysis. Um, and he, a lot of the work that he did was with patients with schizophrenia, mm -hmm. right? So looking to see, could you see changes in the behavior of someone diagnosed with schizophrenia when behavior or behavioral consequences were applied and and you can mm -hmm. so he was one of the first people that that was sort of forayed into that area 
He also was very, very early uh, examiner of verbal behavior. So he has a study published in 1959 Mm -hmm. uh, reviewing the experimental manipulation of verbal behavior. And that's like, he was right there in the thick of it, right? So this is one of the, you know, founding fathers of behavior analysis and certainly is sad uh, to hear of his passing as well. So you certainly wanted to acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the last one I I know, I think we added because it was someone who may not be as well known in some some community. I think of the the community at large, but in some, and that's Renee Mansfield, who worked for many years at New England Center for Children and was notable for developing the creator and inventor, you noted here, of the autism curriculum encyclopedia. So I know that that is- She's a patent holder. You get a patent on that? Mm -hmm. Yep. How do you get a patent on- she applied for a patent. Wow, it's I thought you'd like make a creation. Like it's it not was. a box of, you know, levers and things. <laughs> she created it, the yeah. internet platform. So it's well, you guys have used it more than I have. I've I've used it a little bit more recently. Matt, are you have you ever used did any of the schools up in New Hampshire that you've worked at use the autism curriculum encyclopedia or not um not any that I've worked in. Um I think some do, uh but None, none that I'm directly involved in. That's okay. It's very handy. I'll let yeah. you talk. Yeah. So the Autism Curriculum Encyclopedia um, is a internet curriculum bank of over 3,000 lesson plans that can be modified over um, eight or nine different domains that span the lifehood is that the word? Mm, I think it's the, the lifespan, but you already life. said span, oh. so then you got a little off there. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> the lifehood, I'm using it, of the individual. Thank you. <laughs> I have a PhD. I can make that word up. Um, so there are curricula designed for uh, preschoolers all the way up to adulthood, spanning self, uh, self-advocacy, education, self-care, basically vocational skills, everything that you can think of. Um, And it's all in one little handy little packet. And you can also take mobile data collection and analyze your data with graphs. It generates reports. It does preference assessments. The Autism Curriculum Encyclopedia also um, uh, is the placeholder of the core skills assessment um, that the New England Center for Children created. Um, And Renee was my boss for, for a very long time. Um, and she was lovely in a lot of ways that Tony Nevin was. So very, you know, compassionate and empathetic, um, excited about behavior analysis in life in general and yeah. beer. She loved beer. <laughs> um, she and, really led by example as mm-hmm. well. So she was not someone who just told others what to do. She was the one doing it. Mm-hmm. And she was a very gentle soul. Mm-hmm. And she's certainly going to be greatly missed. So yeah. if you, if anyone out there looks looks her up, You'll find her as like the second and third author on several different studies. A lot of them were related to social skills, video modeling. Right. Um, prior to taking over the, this huge job as this curriculum development person, uh, she worked in the early intervention side at NECC. So a lot of the research that she was involved in was ref- is reflected there. But it would the you know just like most companies, I think. And ECC just had its own bank of curricula that were kept in the, on the intranet. Mm-hmm. And she was the person that said, why don't we see if we can't make this something more useful and what's the word? Share it. More, more open shareable. Access. Yeah. Open yeah, access, know, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the very first versions of the ACE were when I first started working there and it was still intranet. Right, mm-hmm. you guys remember? Right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And I was, was in like the focus group. I think after the first thing. couple months. Yeah. Like, what do you like about it? I'm like, well, well I think I think you need to hire someone who knows how to use computers to make this functional. <laughs> but it was, but yeah. it was very, it was very, that, very forward thinking. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, like the idea was great. But we think I, I, it's one of those things. I think you know, g- generations now who've only been in behavior analysis for you know maybe five, even ten years, yeah. just have always known. Yeah, there's always been an internet. There's always been a way to share documents. And certainly if you've only gotten your BCA in the last three to five years, 
you've probably had a lot of these things shared with you or like, let me share that with you. It's on my Google Drive. And mm-hmm. you just you have everyone's repository of reports and curricula right. just at your fingertips on the Internet. People but this type was in, this would have been what sh- what resources will you yeah. give me? And then people just yeah, this yeah. would have been like oh four oh five. I mean, when, mm-hmm. when that was really in its infancy, the idea of not just you can put things online and share them, but you can have these you know, actual useful information online, not just, you know, download your favorite Simpsons sound bites and all that stuff. You know, you yeah. could get real <laughs> curriculum that you could do, uh, do the job of uh, an ABA, you know, an RBT. It wasn't even an RBT then. Um, you could do that job almost using the, using the curriculum. Yeah. And uh, I think it's like a reflection of the, of the growth of the field, which we'll get to in a little bit in terms of mm-hmm. how it's growing up in front of our, you know, in front of our eyes, you know, and, and there's all sorts of these things popping up now. But you're right, Rob. Uh, I always, you know, I, I got my first job uh, out of grad school in uh, 1999. And uh, man, it was, a, you know, techn- technology wise, it was the dark ages. You know? <laughs> and, um, and, and it is interesting when we talk to younger practitioners who, as you say, you know, um, just aren't aware that uh, you know of how how challenging it was to get good information to 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 share information and things like that. So that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to do a lot of hiring, and if you're in this, if you're in the Massachusetts area, you are mostly getting applicants who've worked at some of the big name schools. A lot of them in NECC, and when you talk about what assessments have you done, a lot of them would say, "Oh, well." or what programs have used with assessments. I've used the autism curriculum encyclopedia. And, and and it was weird because I still remembered when it first started. And it was like, yeah, that was a cool idea. I wonder if that's working yet. And to hear hear young people talking about it with a lot of reverence, like, no, no, this is the thing I knew how to do, was was really amazing. So, all those young people. All those young, young people. people. <laughs> Damn young people. Uh. <laughs> so that, that concludes our list of of individuals that we were going to mention. I'm sure there are many others out there that uh, we hadn't had the pleasure of meeting or hearing about who were lost in our field Mm -hmm. this year. So, um, you know, anyone who's listening can bring us stories about someone if you want to. That would be lovely. Um, But we are a small field. So I think when when we lose big names in our field, we all feel it. Mm -hmm. And these folks will certainly be missed. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to another uh, kind of sad, <laughs> sad topic in ABA this year. So I, I think one of the positives. It, it will oh, get better, folks. Just it will. Yeah. <laughs> this is going somewhere. I promise. I mean, 2018, we're ready. I think we're all ready, right? But Everyone let's... says that about every, every single year. year. But maybe this year more than maybe other years. I don't know. Every, ready, every year. 2019, 2018, all done. Mm-hmm. At some point, we if I think when we talk about the previous year, I was like, oh, that was the worst year. I can't wait for the next year. It's like, guys, if you track, you know, the amount of like negative, negative feelings about the previous year. I mean, it's like a downward graph. <laughs> we should probably be changing our ways a bit. If that's how we feel about every year. It's worse than the last. <laughs> okay. Here it is. It's the slow spiral towards death, Rob. You know what? I, what's going on here? I'm going to take this negative topic and turn it into a positive. So, okay. one of the areas I think in just society in general that was very big in 2018 was the Me Too movement, in which it, 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 you know the it was mostly out of you know mostly female. Though I, there have been males who have, have hashtag are you, Me are Too. You <laughs> I'm not trying to mansplain. I mean, I'm explaining to the audience. Hey, hey uh, would you like to do it? Jackie and Diana, <laughs> Rob and I have this segment. Okay, right. gotcha. So you yeah. guys just, you know, I'm gonna go just take a hot bath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get, have some just tea. Do you want to do the summary? I'm just doing the summary. I'm just have some I'm tea. Just, just tea <laughs> Fine, go ahead. But it was a, a, the, the the big movement where pop, the population to be taken advantage of again, mostly by men in uh, sexually said nope, that's enough, that's not appropriate, and has really become I think a positive change. I think it was kind of that moment where we talk about. You know, progress for you know different groups that had been put upon for so many years, and it's sort of like, well, maybe it'll get better. I think this was the year where everyone was like, you know what? I think it's this year. This is the year everyone's done with it. You know, we're gonna we're gonna put you know power differential and harassment. We're gonna put that as as one of the. You don't have to play nice about it. You don't have to be like, well, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. No, it's not okay. We're gonna stop. We're gonna stop that. Okay. 
And this uh, sort of came into the unit. You know, we wouldn't think it would happen necessarily in our field, but it did, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, become something that came up. And that was set up by a talk given by uh, Dick Malott at, what was it? Was it Calaba? Calaba. Um, I mostly heard about it after the fact and sort of read some of the, the reflection pieces that had come up. Uh, yeah, it basically so, blew up Facebook. Uh, yeah. If anyone yeah. was following any of the ABA Facebook groups, uh, I just remember, you know, o- opening up Facebook and seeing all these posts of like, he said what? You know, yeah. and was, you know went on and on and on. Yeah, it was um, like real time occurrence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. it was happening. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and it, it was, um, and again, the, the, all these, all these, uh, posts were, were, you know, popping up and it, I, I think what it seemed to do is it was just kind of like a, a, a touchstone, if you will, meaning that, uh, you know, it, it, it seemed to open up a lot of, uh, you know, pent up, uh, you know, uh, fr- frustrations of people, you know, being mistreated, you know, more generally. So what I'm what I mean by that is that this, you know, it seemed to go way beyond, you know, Dick Malott's really, uh, you know, ter- you know, terrible choices of uh, you know words at this particular talk to, you know, encompass a whole host of, you know, kind of mistreatment uh, of, of, of women in the field. And of course, women are, you know, the large majority of the field, so yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's even you know kind of more, I guess. Uh, uh, keep coming back to the word ironic. I know that's probably not the most uh, uh, appropriate word, but you know, it's just the um, you know how how it all kind of uh, blew up after that. Um, you know, it, it reminded me of of something that uh, you know it reminded me of a couple of things. One is you know um, science. And, and I guess the, the the applied wing of our science, is, you know, as well, uh, is a social endeavor, right? At the end of it, you know, it's all behavior, if you will. Right. And one of the things that um, you know Pat Fryman will talk about from time to time is that you know behavior analysts are not inoculated from the contingencies that govern behavior, meaning that you know we we make mistakes, uh, we we might. Um, engage in, in patterns of problematic behavior that contact reinforcement and therefore continue and things like that. Um, and so, you know, we are not, uh, you know, ab- above that, if you will. And I think maybe for some that was kind of a sobering reality, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think if you, you know, if you chat for, with some folks, especially folks who've been in the field for a long time, particularly if you chat with them over a few drinks at a conference, you know, you'll probably start to hear some, you know, some stories get told and, you know, uh, off the record of, you know, so-and-so, uh, you know, made, made some, you know, uh, you know, really terrible comment or, you know, maybe grope someone or something like that. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was pretty sobering. It's like, gosh, this is happening in our field, you know? And mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, often sometimes by people in very, very, high levels of power. Mm -hmm. I remember as a graduate student, actually in my master's program, uh, I was in a class and my professor of the class was like, okay, we're all going to ABAI this year. Stay away from this one person in the field because this one person will try, will say inappropriate things to you or may try to do something that you might not like doing. So I'm warning you now, don't go near this person even though this person is a prominent person in the field. And that person was... Right, I was going to ask the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> right, but That'll like, be in the show notes. Happen. Go to abainsidetrack.com. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> We're a dish. Yeah, but that, I mean, that shouldn't be right. happening, right? Like, if this is like a thing, like, if, like, professors are telling their students, hey, I don't think you should talk to this one person. Stay away from them. Mm-hmm. Maybe something should be done about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is all just giving everyone an opportunity to talk Right. about it Absolutely. right so it's not to say that this is exclusive to behavior analysis of course not these are the types of problems are happening in basically every field for a long 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 time mm-hmm. uh, but the beauty of the me too movement and and uh, we have our own hashtag which is times up aba i think that was what they what, what um, everyone was using at least around this time period the beauty of that is that it, it opens up conversation around this topic. So it allows everyone to say, 
these things happened to me or someone that I know, and it brings everything up to the forefront. So we're no longer maybe only whispering about it, but we're actually holding people accountable for their behavior, mm. which is, I mean, I like what you said, Matt, the, about, or what Pat said, <laughs> uh, you know, about people. I, I can paraphrase with the best of them. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. <laughs> but it absolutely makes, makes sense, right? That people behave in the ways that their behavior is reinforced. Mm. But if you're only thinking in the short term, that's the behavior that you end up with. But I think as a field, we need to be thinking long term about how our, is our field being represented uh, and how are we treating folks within the field? Because while behavior analysis is majority of women, we need to think about who's in the positions of power in the relationships that we have professionally in our field. And uh, that is still predominantly men. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's shifting. And I know we had. Um, not that we got to get rid of all the men. No, certainly not. But I think that, that that's really shifting just when you have a yes. group that is the majority of practitioners are women over time, even without you know efforts being made to provide more opportunities or, or increase the diversity of sort of the leaders in the field. We would hope to continue to see that become a more diverse group. So the people who have more of the power will be from lots of different backgrounds, and that will, you know, hopefully continue to help with when there's a power differential. People not trying to take advantage of that power differential because ethically we're not supposed to do that. We're not. It's in the ethics oh guidelines, and therefore, goes um, I mean, it's not power differential, but but right. but and all of the guidelines uh, have to do with situations in which there is a power differential. Yeah, and, and Melissa Nosek gave a nice talk at Babbitt this year, where she, this is what she was talking about, is women in the field. And, and she gave a lot of different statistics to try to examine the breakdown of where are women entering into the field, where are they staying in the field? And, um, you know, most people who come into positions of authority within the field do so through a research and academic roots, right? So if we want to really be gauging how our field's uh, power players may change over time. We should be looking to see who's entering into PhD programs, who's uh, going into full-time professorship positions, et cetera. And, and those numbers are changing slowly to become more of an equitable rate between men and women. So I think over time, we'll see more women in those positions, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this might be a good good time to transition into the next topic, which is the growth of ABA and, and thinking about the positives of that. And that's mostly positive, though. Again, kind of looking at, at the no <laughs> the notes, there are some there are some things to be wary of and getting ready for 2019. But uh, as a field, you know, it is it is nice to feel that we are starting to move out of just being like, hey, don't you guys work with the kids with autism and just being hired as you know, individual consultants or individual therapists. And we've seen you know real growth of industry, both in, again, the field of, of autism treatment, but also in other areas. So what are some areas that the folks have seen that that growth that they feel has been really salient this year? Um, well, for, for me, I think it, it's just a, a recognition that you know we've we've transitioned from a practice that has been uh i guess a practice that's been practiced that's probably a better way to say that but anyway <laughs> a, a field uh, that has uh, occurred in the settings that were made you know educational or institutional and and uh now they are you know now it's a, a bona fide healthcare service you know obviously the game changer is the uh, in, insurance funding of course and so it is um I think sometimes it's easier now to kind of tell people about ABA, you know, mm -hmm. because of that, you know, or, or what an ABA clinic is, you know, um, because there are more close parallels to other types of healthcare settings, you know, like a PT clinic or a dental office or whatever. You just, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a client of that practi practice, you just, you know, go there more frequently, you know, <laughs> instead of like your right. six month cleaning, <laughs> you know, um, you know, but that's why I think. Physical therapy might be a closer, a, 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 a closer one, but I don't know. It's still not still. There's, there's no perfect, uh, you know, I guess, uh, analogy, but it, it, we're we're getting closer to it, and I think that might be helpful f for folks to kind of a take behavior analysis more seriously and b help to kind of um, place it in its proper context of what it actually is, uh, as opposed to this thing that you know some people do in schools. 
you know some people do in in like these specialized you know educational settings like like NEC and elsewhere and so on. So I think that's something. Obviously, this has been an evolution that's that's been going on for you know maybe the last five ten years or so. But I, it just seems like with the increased demand for these services that it, it, it's that point to me was all the more salient. You know, I've had a couple of folks on on my show uh, talking about running big ABA practices. You know, I, like uh, like Brett Denovi. Um, Jason Simmons mm-hmm. of Clinical Behavior Analysis in, in, uh, in Kentucky, and um, and other other people running you know, large, you know, big time organizations. You know, um, it's just amazing to see our field kind of grow up, like literally right before our eyes. And these things, at least for, from my perspective, were were kind of unthinkable. You know, when I moved to New Hampshire, when we moved back to New Hampshire in two thousand four, I think I was one of three or four BCBAs in the state. Wow, and, um, uh, and no one knew what one was, uh, and, right. and people laugh these days about no one knows what behavior analysis is. You know, it was even a <laughs> oh, yeah. hundred times worse uh, back then. Um, and we would be like knocking on the doors of schools, saying, "Hey, we have this stuff. We can help you with your, you know." And people <laughs> were like, "I don't know," you know. <laughs> so so it, it, it's just, it's just, uh, uh, it's just nice to see a transition from that to to kind of where it is now, where it's a real legit reimbursable healthcare service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also think it's amazing to see you know colleagues of mine s- strike out on their own and start their own entire organizations, behavior analytic services, mm-hmm. and they're running full full fledged companies, and they have employees and insurance and their billing insurance and they have liability and healthcare and all these things that to me, it's like, well, we didn't go to school for any of that. Mm-hmm. You know, like they were in my master's classes with me and we just, you know, talked about verbal behavior together. And then suddenly they're running a business and it's amazing. I, uh, I think that, you know, we prepare our students well to be behavior analysts in the sense of producing behavior change, <laughs> functional and reasonable, socially valid behavior change, right? But we don't teach anyone anything about how to run a business. No. Mm-hmm. Um, but Most a lot people, of people don't learn how to run a business. Yeah, but a lot, a lot of people do. No, a lot of people have a lot, learned how, but it's not, yeah. A lot of people have yeah. learned, but... Yeah, like, um, lot, and, and through, through trial and error, uh, you know. Right. But Seriously. The, the, the cool thing that I'm seeing a lot of is, you know, there's a lot of, like, business boot camps that are now available as workshops, uh, either as standalone ones or, you know, mm-hmm. kind of tacked on to, you know, large national or regional conferences. So, you know, there, are, uh, this is, this is a topic that's getting attention, you know, okay, if there's going to mm-hmm. be people who, you know, as you say, Diana, you know, are striking out in the run, um, they're going to need to learn things like, uh, you know, accounting, finance, HR, and, and things like that, yeah. you know, and it's, I think another cool thing related to this that I, is just really neat to see is the um, two things. One is that you know there's there's these this increasing kind of you know what we might call business to business services you know that are out there in our field you know so what mm-hmm. and, and, and you know whether it's like these billing yeah. companies or mm-hmm. you know practice management companies like Central Reach and AccuPoint and um, you know we already talked about ACE you know things that help facilitate the, the clinical side of things. Um, you know, there's, and, and while we're on this topic, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give, um, uh, uh, Becca tag a shout out from the, and she created the ABA business builders, Facebook group, and also is another podcaster, the uh, business of behavior podcast. Yeah. Uh, and that's all, that's all she, not all she talks about, but I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's her focus of, of those endeavors is to, is to get good information to people, uh, so they can, they don't have to, um, you know, recreate the wheel for everything. You know, you go on those groups and someone's like, hey, I need like a, a new hire packet, you know, and, mm. ne- you know, next thing you know, they're getting PM'd with all sorts of, you know, all, all sorts of assistance. It's, it's a really, right. it's a really neat thing. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I mean, I, I still remember when I, I think, you know, coming right out of my kind of initial training, the idea of, well, do you want something? You'll probably have to make it because, if it exists, some, you know, who knows who made it? It's not in any one place. So you're probably better off just using what you know and recreating it. So, I mean, I remember recreating, you know, simple data sheets, sim- you know, basic curricula. Oh, I, sure. And it was one of those things that, I mean, you, you got good at and you took pride in it and you could, you could fine tune it. But 
the issue I think nowadays is there are too many there are too many you know too many people who need this service to just be creating everything from scratch, and there are too many businesses popping up that couldn't spend the time and the resources just to create stuff. So there's well, you just have limited time. Yeah, there's resources. such a need. So such a need for that. Yeah, you want to use it in the best way. Support you know support fields. Right, and I I, I think our it's just as important for our field to be well represented in the way that these little companies are running themselves, right? As the quality of services that we provide, mm-hmm. because they end up being tied together. So if you have a company that you know can't keep staff because there's a high level of turnover or is committing insurance fraud or is, you know, they can't provide <laughs> like enough Florida. hours to their to their clients because they have don't have things organized well. Like all of those impact the services that are provided to clients and they also impact uh, the reputation of that business in that community, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that helping behavior analysts who want to pursue this with giving them the tools that they need to be successful in in applying what we know about behavior analysis and behavioral economics and um, OBM OBM to their business (laughs) is incredibly important. Yeah. Oh, it's it's weird. And you you mentioned it earlier, Matt, the idea that this is a field that has has been growing up, you know, in front of all of our eyes. And it's strange to feel like I've been in this field that long, but I'm you know, we're sort of on the the more the early end of of everything going on just in terms of numbers uh, and to have seen, you know, from start of career to present just such a such a shift and such a change is 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 very humbling. It's a little scary. It's very cool, certainly, to to feel like, oh, I'm a part of that field. Yay! It's exciting. Nice to- I, I find it exciting, uh, you know. And I think, uh, as Jim Carr said um, uh, at a conference I, uh, that I uh, at New Hampshire Ava, as I uh, put in a little plug, um, uh, you know, this field is in, in, it's in its adolescence, you know. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Uh, I think that is more than just a chronological reference, if I can read between the lines. Yeah. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, what, what's also interesting is, you know, and this is something I know very, very little about it, other than to know that it's happening is, you know, this whole whole area of, say, venture capital companies getting interest, mm-hmm. becoming mm-hmm. interested in, in, in ABA providers. And uh, I don't know much about that either. Well, I know everything. I know when you say VC, it means venture capital. I know it from like That's watching Silicon Valley and just sort of <laughs> thinking about like, hey, I want to give you a million dollars for this app that identifies, you know, hot dog, not hot dog. I kind of that's kind of what I think of when I when I hear venture capitalists. Yeah, I mean, uh, or private equity, I think is probably the term that might mm. be more appropriate. Okay, yeah. uh, um, you know, of of, of you know. The, these companies, you know, uh, when they're running correctly and all that stuff, uh, you know, can be can be profitable and people and, it, and it's getting attention of, you know, uh, larger companies that may want to acquire them. Uh, and it has the potential to result in these large organizations not being run with someone by by people that hold our values mm-hmm. you know, and are not bound by our um, you know ethical standards. You know, so this is so this. It's cool to see the growth, and I think it's just something we're gonna have to, have to, you know, as a field, we'll have to keep our eye on and make sure that um, the uh, uh, the values of, of of what we're trying to do to you know serve the the you know the the, the clients are, are maintained at the at the forefront. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Though now that you brought that up, I didn't think about it, but multiple small companies that I know of, like within the last like five years, have been bought by larger companies. Yep, um, and that's and. Not- Okay, I'm sorry. It's not bad. No, exactly. it's not a bad yeah, that, thing. But I never even like thought about that as a thing yeah. until right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I I know people personally who you know who are you know in you know have have purchased smaller ABA providers, mm-hmm. uh, and, and the organizations that they represent are you know doing really really good work. So it's you know, like you say, it's not all bad. It's just you know, um, I think it's just new and different to to uh, you know. It's it's a it's a new phenomenon, you know, and there might be, uh, you know, perhaps not 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 so awesome example, examples of that as well. Right? But, you know, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, Unfortunately, in the news, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. 
Well, let's let's kind of come come to the end of our, our review of 2018 and sort of our look ahead by talking a little bit about all the new media that's sprung up. So just like every other field, ABA is going to be no exception to how uh, I think individuals consume content. And again, for us, most of our content is our you know, the, the research and uh, the you know, discussions we have. And I think that's moving away from the you can only talk about research with a coworker or when you go to a conference too you can talk about ABA all the time with professionals from all over the world which Everywhere. is very <laughs> exciting i think this is this year and last year were the first year that i was like you know what i need a copy of a, of an article i'm not paying 40 dollars to research gate Hell i'm going to no. email one of the writers i email one of the authors and almost all the time they wrote me back real quick and they were so polite and it was it was very empowering that you know what i guess i could have done this at any time but this was the year that uh I think everyone, everyone in the field felt a little bit closer, you know, personally to me that you could you could reach out and and get information without needing to go to a conference or ask someone who you think knows somebody who might know somebody if they could ask, you know, you could just be direct about it. So that, that's my personal anecdote. Yeah, I agree. I, I tell people who will, anyone who listen that you know if you're interested in a researcher's work, you know, if you think of how long it takes. And I don't actually know because I, I don't think I've ever published anything. In, in, no, I know I've never published anything in Java or whatever, but you know, I know a lot of people who have. And you know, it takes years to get something through the, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the process. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I see you guys nodding your head. Yes. Right, right. So no, you I, I just know from secondhand experience. I've also never published anything yes, in yeah. Java. One, uh, one yeah. time I had a research article that didn't get published for six years. Right. So That's think of the blood, sweat, and tears that. Jackie, awesome. if, you, if, if you think of the blood, sweat, and tears that went into your article, right? And if someone emailed you Lots randomly, <laughs> like you would, you would stalk them, right? You'd, you'd, you'd hand deliver the paper to their house more than likely. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm just kidding. I'd be like, good morning. Here's your eggs and your coffee and my article. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk about it. You know, but, yeah. you know, I mean, kidding it's aside, you know, <laughs> you know, anytime I've, I've wanted to reach out and, and get more information on a particular topic that especially that's been – you know, published in the literature, the, the, the authors are exceedingly, exceedingly nice and um, are, are oftentimes don't just send you the article itself. It's, oh, yeah, well, you might want to look at this or that or the other thing, too. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's pretty neat. They're just like us. <laughs> That's the new section of Java. And you're like researchers. They're just like us. They take out the garbage. Go to Starbucks. That's right. <laughs> But I think sometimes you forget that, though, right? Like I always forget that. I, I think it's only been a few years that I've been able to go to a conference. And I'm like, oh my god, that's oh, oh, yeah. oh, I can't talk to them. They don't want. They don't want to talk to me. I'm mm -hmm. nobody. Yeah. Yeah, they're just like us guys, except they might get up at like four in the morning and go running every day. We don't do that. <laughs> that is not. Why me. would they do that? Because huh? they have really good time management skills. Oh, so, okay. Right. Maybe what if, someday. Yeah. I'm just bringing up like one person that I like idolize <laughs> that gets up at four o'clock every day and runs every day. Who gets up and runs at four? Like, can you say that's a positive? I assume. Why, why would you do that? I don't know. It's crazy. I'm not going to say it just it's in case you no longer you reveal her identity. It's very dark. Yeah, why on earth would you do her. that? I, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So it's it's cool. And then also, I think. It, in addition to just plain old email, uh, you know, there's other other media out there. You know, in terms of, you know, obviously, um, you know, there's uh, the social media groups, which I think uh, can be helpful. And I'll, although I, you know, I kind of I kind of would like this last last segment to be kind of downer free. Uh, <laughs> there are some caveats about you know getting information on social media, but I yes. think yeah. both both yeah. you guys and uh, you guys have documented that pretty well in previous episodes. As as we have keep I keep bringing it up over <laughs> and over again, um, you know, and so we don't need to beat that horse here. Um, but you know, it's it is fun to to you know connect with people from all around the world. Um, I'm willing to bet that you guys get correspondence from folks you know here, there, and everywhere. Um, you do. You know, and I bet you do too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. Uh, you know, it's if you cool. look, at, um, you know, if I look at my podcast analytics, you can see what countries people download, you know, from, and um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's just really neat to see the the download numbers all literally across the globe. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it would map on perfectly to like ABA programs, right? If you if you overlaid it on a map of like where are master's programs in ABA mm -hmm. and where are people downloading from. 
for us, it matches up. So like those little pockets of the world that, mm-hmm. that seem to have. Oh activity. yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Like, yeah. you know, there's, you know, there's, you know, obviously the United States and Canada are, you know, um, the main, I guess, consumers of, of just, you know, speaking from my show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then That's probably, yeah, it's the same. <laughs> you know, and then second to that, you know, is perhaps the rest of the, you know, English speaking countries, you know, England and Ireland, Ireland, and then, um, Australia, New Zealand to a lesser extent. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, um, you know, Brazil, Israel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny when you go through the list. It's like I never knew there was a country called that. You know, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like just like scrolling through it one day for for giggles, and uh, you know, it's like I, you know, that country has no vowels in its name. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's great. It's you know, yeah, it's, it really it's super is cool. Like, um, and I always wonder, like, you know, did, did that person in Iran like just like did they do the podcast equivalent of butt dialing? Like, did they just yeah. you know, click on something randomly, <laughs> or, or you know, it's like yeah, or they're they're looking for something just sort of like American legal advice, and they got <laughs> ABA, like the yeah. bar yeah. That could happen. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah I mean, how many accidental? Like, wait a minute, this is no legal advice at all in these podcasts. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, I I think. Uh, um, yeah, that that's been that's been neat. Another thing I thought was pretty cool this year, and I know you guys, uh, you, you guys went out to a conference, did a live podcast, and I had the opportunity to do that as well. So, um, yeah, that, that, and, and I also am aware of like, um, um, been at a couple of conferences with my friend Ryan O'Donnell with his Daily BA channel, yeah. uh, and, and so conferences are are bringing new media, uh, I guess, purveyors out to 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 you know, provide coverage and, and whatnot to the events and maybe add something a little bit different. So, um, that's something I think is, uh, you know, um, a really neat development. <laughs> Selfish. I think it's awesome. Personally. <laughs> that's, Isn't it crazy? People want us to go, but I know, I know it's, right. but it, it's, it's, it is true that I, I think the first year, was it like two, well, it would have been the first year that we, we were doing the the podcast and that would have been around your first year too when we went to the Babbitt conference and I was like, we're going to bring microphones. We should interview people. That'll be fun. And it was people who sort of got, had kind of gotten that or people who'd been on our show already sort of were like, oh, that's fun. And a lot of people were like, what are you doing? You're doing what now? That's bizarre. And then even the year after, yeah. and then certainly this year it was like, oh, sure. That sounds great. Very excited. Like it's, it's a known thing. Like, oh, bring a microphone to things. That's fine. What, what a good idea. I mean, so many of the conferences I think we've been to, to have it tried to do live streaming or had, you know, social links on their conference app, you know, which, which I really never, I really expected to take a lot longer for, you know, conferences, which seem like kind of the fuddy duddy, oh, those are going to take forever to change, mm-hmm. have, have really kind of skidded into the, the new media shifts, which <laughs> is probably good because, again, skidded. looking like into, that. well, I mean, because it, it's one, again, one of those things I think it's positive, but also a little, a little, a little, a little scary, you know, thinking about a couple of years from now, how are people going to be getting their media? And man, the number of parents I talk to, they're like, oh, my kid just starts to watch YouTube. And I'm like, that's you don't you, you do that when you want to find something, you maybe go to YouTube. But the idea that that's just where you would go mm-hmm. for your content and that's the first place you go. I mean, that makes me feel old because that sounds very scary. I, if I want to watch someone beat like an old Nintendo game, I go to YouTube. <laughs> I would never just go to YouTube to watch shows, really. You don't like to watch things being unwrapped? <laughs> I don't want to watch things being unwrapped. She's three no. And no. she finds it. I don't know, man. Not I, me. But I. I I think that this melding of the new types of social media with conferences is a really good example of yes, how I like we that can example. use social media well, right? It's like the the shrinking of the world and the connecting of people across the world in the ways that are, are really beneficial. Because not everyone can go to a conference, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that if we want behavior analysts to have access to the most current research, then we need to think of creative ways to, to get them that access. And mm-hmm. it can be really cost prohibitive and resource prohibitive overall to attend a conference. Mm-hmm. So being able to access it in smaller ways, and if we as podcasters can be part of that, then I think that that's great and needed in our field. Yeah. I also think, right. too, that you know, if you think of all the conferences that are out there right now, you know, the calendar really becomes quite constricted. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. I, <laughs> excuse me. And I, I think that... Um, you know, conferences, if they're going to want attendees, they're going to have they're going to start to have to compete with one another. Um, although mm-hmm. like, obviously here in New England, we, we're we don't have that problem. We have the opposite problem, meaning that 
Babbitt, Mass ABA, New Hampshire ABA. I know New Hampshire ABA. You know, we're we're four four conferences in, and the last two, I maybe the last three, we've sold out, and like wow. you know, yeah, like you know. So, um, and I'm I'm obviously you know trying to get into Babbitt. It's like trying to get into like you know <laughs> the know. hottest concert ever. Yeah, yeah. Not I'm, anymore though. They move venues, so next year it'll be better. But <laughs> yes, that's amazing. yeah. Trying to but get he, Hamilton tickets. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Thank you. I was I was gonna say a, 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 a band, but then I realized like you know most of the bands I listen to are you know don't tour anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or they do, and there's like tons of empty seats. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I think being able to offer something that's a little bit different and things like that. Another cool thing that just occurred to me that um, is the the advent of live streaming these events too, and be able, you know, so it, yeah. it, it's not just the the coverage that you know folks like us or you know uh, Ryan or other folks can provide, but uh, it's the um, it's the ability for folks to you know, okay, it's sold out, but, you know, or, or you know, if, it, if it's cost prohibitive from a travel standpoint, you, you can live stream an event and the technology, the barriers to doing that from a technological standpoint are, are, be, are coming down. Mm-hmm. And so the, the yeah. ability to do that does a couple things. One, obviously it helps the, the clinician or the practitioner who's trying to get CEs and, you know, you know, can't take the time off from work to, you know, to travel. Um, but just from a from a revenue standpoint, it's another revenue stream for the co- for the mm-hmm. conference provider. So whether it's you know, uh, you know, again looking at our state association here in in uh, New Hampshire, that might be something uh, um, you know they might want to take a look at down the road uh, as a as a way to um, you know add another revenue stream, uh, especially yeah. since that again you know we, we've sold we sold the conference out. And, uh, you know, we have waiting lists and, and that, that sort of thing. And wouldn't it be nice to offer that as, a, as another option? Mm. Baba did that this year, and it was really actually fairly successful. Yeah. Um, everyone said that uh, they really enjoyed the live streaming, and they actually wished that it would have been available for more events since it was only inv- available yeah, the for the big auditorium events. Mm-hmm. Um, Pretty good. But it was a fancy camera they had set up. I, yeah. was, I was scared to walk too near it yeah. for fear I'd trip over it or something but one of our colleagues uh one of diana and i mine i never got it right diana and then my my, say, it, diana say my. it the way that you would if you didn't include me at all diana and my colleagues yeah, yeah thanks just a little grammar lesson <laughs> one of our uh, colleagues that she uh <laughs> <laughs> she attended I'm big into experiential uh, avoidance <laughs> okay. she attended the the live stream and said it was amazing yeah like she loved it cool deal yeah uh, well, so much to look forward to, so much to look back on, so much to look forward to. I want to just kind of go around the table as, as we kind of wind down 2018 and say, what's something you're looking forward to in, in 2019? And this could be in the field or you know what? Let's open it up to just something you're hoping happens in 2019. <laughs> let's not. Yeah, that's, anything that's in the possibly world. broad, but I like it. <laughs> I love that. I think we we're good and on topic for, for the whole the whole time we've been <laughs> recording. So We don't have to be on topic. <laughs> So what are you looking forward to in 2019? I am looking forward to getting the list of research articles that have been on my desk that need to be finished and submitted for publication out. Yes. Hopefully in the next plan. two weeks. Oh, that's <laughs> wow. hilarious. That's ambitious. <laughs> but not, not really. But I would like to get at least two to three out within the next like six yeah. months because mm-hmm. one of them is over a year old. One of them is over two years old. Uh, one of them needs to be done per grant funding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I would really love for 2019 to give me research bliss, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. How would anyone I, else? I'm in a similar situation yeah. where I have some that I need to put out there, and then I have some other projects that I'm excited about getting started. So mm-hmm. I have parent training research I want to do. I have some uh, cl- in the classroom type of research that I want to do. I also have student, my master's students research that is ongoing that is like really cool projects. So I want to manage all of those irons that are in the fire. Are they in the fire? Yeah, your irons are in the fire. You got a lot of irons in the fire. I do. Yeah. Some of them are on the back burner fire, some of them are front burner fire, (laughs) right? And some of the candles are burning at both ends. Oof. Yeah. So there's like a lot going on, but I'm hoping to manage that if we're talking about like my research. Okay. Role, yeah, and in my personal life, 
Uh, we got a new couch. Most people know that by now. That's true. We did bring that up a few times. We should start, we should start so recording exciting. at the couch. Yeah. Instead of the table. Yeah. <laughs> so that has already been my wish list has been fulfilled, and I need nothing. Great. Yeah. Wow. So, Impressive. Yeah. yeah. How about How about you, Matt? Uh, so one of the things I'm looking forward to doing is uh, I am um, starting with uh, some of the schools I consult with uh, doing um, daily act lessons with cohorts of upper elementary students who have emotional behavioral challenges. Oh, and wow. using, that's great. Yeah, and um, we're using the AIM curriculum. Uh, we're not doing the full AIM curriculum with the with the school store and our, or the the point store and all that stuff um, mm-hmm. uh, for for various reasons that um, I won't get into. But uh, uh, it's more about the, the this seems like we can pull this piece of it off at, in in this particular setting and perhaps not all the rest of the stuff. So um, so I am looking forward to. Getting that off the ground, seeing how that works, uh, working the, uh, I guess, the bugs out of it, you know, because it's obviously a scripted curriculum, but, uh, you know, you don't just read it road, of course, and, you know, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing how it works so we can, you know, um, really dial it in. And I'm really hoping that uh, has a positive impact on uh, these students' lives. So that's, uh, that's something I'm really psyched about in the upcoming year. Excellent. Cool. Awesome. That sounds so fun. I, w- I would similarly like to have something good with like with you know emotional mental health. That would be that would be ideal. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be one of my focuses this year. I know one of the things Your I want to foci. I know one of the things that that I'm looking at with one of my my colleagues is uh, social kind of what is a good social skills curriculum for preparing students for college. And so we're, yeah. we're kind of going through the literature. We, 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 did, we did that on one of the episodes, sort of talked about what are some of the problems and deficits, but there's some curriculum out there, published curriculum. So we're going to take this year to try to find what is out there. And then the really hard part, not so much what is out there, because it seems like there's stuff that has research base, but what would anyone who then has to implement these systems like, like or not like about them? And so can we find one that would, would be financially useful and uh, effective as well, because it's not, it's easy to pick one that there's research on this, but then getting folks to buy in on its utility and then seeing that it is actually effective as well, not just from the research. So that's what I'm going to be spending a good chunk of this year on. And I'm, I'm worried it's going to be more than I'll get done in just 2019, but Hey, okay. so you start you start off, but I, I, I want to find, I'd love to find more to sort of help the population of students I think with disabilities that have so many more options once they leave high school than they used to, even even five or ten years, you know, five five years ago, but that there are still areas to work on, and wouldn't it be better to work on them when they're still in school rather than when they're in the adult services where, you know, they may not be. Who working knows? Yeah, who knows? Who knows yeah. what's available at that at that point? So that's what I'm looking forward to, and and the new Star Wars movie as well. <laughs> just just you know, <laughs> if they want to throw us some tickets. That'd be great. Nice. <laughs> right. And the Avengers, the Avengers, Avengers Endgame. We watched this. I watched oh, the trailer of my kids today. Yeah, yeah, we watched that the other day. It looks pretty good. Oof. Oh boy. Well, we'll. we'll How is Tony see. Stark going to get out of? You know, just get. Yeah. <laughs> go, go watch the trailer, folks. See it over time. Diana doesn't like those movies, Matt. She won't watch what? them. I don't know, Jack. Do you like those Marvel movies? No. I assumed you wouldn't. I only like Hallmark movies. Okay. Um, and things that are like. You don't know if they're going to fall in love, but obviously they do. And then something bad happens. But then in the end, they're sitting on the porch, swinging. But the Hulk and Black and Widow, <laughs> you don't know if they're going to get together. They might. It's it's That's possible. True. What I don't like about those, honestly, is that I feel like whatever happens doesn't matter. Well, You're like, they killed this guy. You're like, oh, they're going to bring him back. No, they killed people like and then they don't come back. Just, you know, it is a miracle that we went yeah. an hour and 13 minutes. <laughs> Before a major <laughs> pop culture digression, I I was actually. It I, is actually true. That is that is. I think peace on earth is right around the corner because you know. <laughs> We're pros. We're all pros. That's this right. is a table of pros. That's you know, right. what, are, what are you gonna? Are you, and you count as the table too, Matt. You're just on the computer screen, That's not right. yeah. on your table. <laughs> I mean, the Marcel Marceau, you know. <laughs> oh boy! Well. I hope that I hope fun. listeners to to both one either show enjoyed our our year our ABA year in review. Um, 
if you if you if you enjoyed it and you want to hear kind of one of the, the regular episodes that we all do, you know, certainly Jackie and Diane and I do ABA Inside Track, uh, and then Matt uh, is the host of the Behavioral Observations podcast. Uh, similar topics, so we have a, I think we have a different enough format that you could easily listen to both and just be getting maximizing the yeah. amount of information you learn per week. Totally. Actually, the other day, Matt, someone I was talking to someone, they're like, "Hey, do you listen to podcasts? Uh, I've been listening to this really great podcast called Behavioral Observations." I'm like, "Oh yeah, I've listened to it." <laughs> oh, that's so funny. It was awesome though. Was like, awesome. Do you listen? I'm like, actually, I don't, but I do. Actually. <laughs> but I wanted to say that I don't listen to podcasts. I love it when someone asks me that question. I'm like, well, <laughs> how much time do you have? Let's yeah, see. Right. <laughs> it's gonna take a bit. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Well, I feel like we should end this year in review with the New Year's song. The New Year's wow. song? Been- oh, is that why you is that why you wrote it in the notes? Yeah. I didn't know who, who typed that. I that just saw was them. Me. They appeared. You want to so, sing the song? Yeah. I didn't I thought it was old acquaintance, but it's not. Old. It's old. Yeah. Isn't that just the old spelling? Oh, I don't know. It's the old spelling of old. Oh. No, I thought I it was like all. That. I thought it meant all or something. Oh, well, anyway. Now it's highlighted. I okay. Won't, I won't right. sing it. I'll just sing it to everyone. Oh, if no, we're, we're going to do it, we okay, have to sing it. it. Okay, let's uh, go. Okay, are we good? Really? Ready, Matt? Yeah, right. Here we go. Oh, my God. Okay. Should old acquaintance be forgotten and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and all right. Happy New Year! Happy New Year, everybody! Yay. See y'all! All right, yes. People are gonna give us one star reviews now. <laughs> uh, you're you're sounding pretty bad when you sing. That's well. Great. Come back to us next year for all the <laughs> behavior analysis, and maybe we won't do singing. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see what the reviews have. Right. <laughs> Thanks for having oh, me, guys. Matt. This has been a treat. Oh, yeah. It was Thank great you. to have you, Matt. Thank you so much, Matt. All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>